came of it this week feels like I need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, here we are. Um, this is a very exciting event for me because, um, for those of you who know the Center for Fiction well, um, we, as a little experiment, started to do a little bibliotherapy of our own um, in um, about six months ago or eight months ago, and it's been interesting and challenging and actually a lot of fun. And we really took as our inspiration, you know, the program that Susan has been a part of. Yeah. And so I wanted to, um, you know, hear from actually the progenitor. I mean, bibliotherapy is around in, in, in different kinds of forms for different people. Um, generally, but um, School of Life, this program has been the program I, I think has really popularized it and made people much more aware of it. And so it's really a great treat to have you here, Susan, to be able to hear from, more or less from the horse's mouth um, what you do. And so, and, you know, so I can be ashamed <laughs> oh, all the other things that I do wrong. Um, but, uh, I'm going to ask Susan a lot of questions because I have a lot of questions, but I also, um, we're going to encourage you to ask questions as well. Um, and um, we're even going to maybe ask you to pose some questions uh, for us as bibliotherapists that we might be able to answer, you know, if you don't mind um, revealing your deep, dark problems to all the people in the room. Or even your problems at all, really, you can <laughs> get a recommendation for a book. Um, so, basically, um, my first question to you is, how, how did you begin doing this? What led you to do it? And then, just the experience of doing it, and then we can leave. I'd love to know how that led to the book. But okay. first, I'd like to know how what you got roped into it. Okay. So, um, it all started actually about 25 years ago, I can't believe I'm that old, um, when um, I went to Cambridge to study English and the person living in the room next door um, was um, the other name on this book, Alberti. Um, and we, we, were, we were living in adjacent rooms for the next three years and um, we struck up a friendship over books. I realised that she had the same books on her bookshelf as I had on my bookshelf. And um, we started giving books to each other, not just as presents, but as, um, as pick-me-ups, as moral correctives. Um, she needed a lot more moral correcting than I did, obviously. Um, and, Since and you're here, she Yeah, exactly. Um, and, um, uh, and, and there's kind of, you know, just if we felt that the other person lacked something in their life, maybe there was somebody in literature who had been through something similar. And, and so the idea kind of snowballed from there, and over the years we started doing the same thing for friends and family. Um, we didn't use the word prescribing for many years, that came later. Um, and we weren't really conscious of bibliotherapy as a term. I and mean, I think it is, it, the origins of bibliotherapy are quite vague, but I think it was used mainly for children, wasn't it, originally? Mm -hmm. as, and um, children who were troubled were read stories to help them. Um, so in 2008, we took, we kind of talked about taking the idea of, and then we did use the term bibliotherapy, um, to adults and, and using it to, to directly um, address ailments of, of different sorts that adults might be experiencing, and largely prescribing fiction for those ailments, although we, we did start non-fiction as well. And we took this idea to a, a wonderful institution uh, in London called the School of Life, which some people may have heard of. No, that's no over here. Um, they've got a big web presence. They were started by a writer and philosopher called Alan de Botton, um, who's great, and uh, some smarts of recognition. And they, they basically set up an alternative educational establishment in London to very much geared towards young people in their 20s and 30s, but, but other people too were found it. Um, and they had courses and workshops um, which, which were very philosophically based. They're kind of self help but philosophically driven and very intellectual and in a fun way. Um, so anyway, we were, it was a perfect fit actually and we kind of set up the service now and started seeing clients. And it was a, it was, you know, a dream job, um, yeah. as I'm sure it is for you too, just yeah. to sit with a client, find out their reading taste, 
work out um, what, what issues are going on for them in their life and try and find the perfect novel for them to read right now. Um, and you know, it's it's one of those things that we stumble on if we're lucky by chance in our life in our lives, you know, sometimes we happen to pick up the right novel that makes us feel better in that moment or that sheds light on an issue which we're struggling with or just gives opens a door to something new. Um, but we, we just kind of wanted to make it um, easier for people, so which is why um, we wrote the book that um, is the instigation for this meeting tonight, which is called The Novel Cure, and, um, and it's a reference book, really, of, of ailments from A to Z, um, and some of them are emotional ailments, some of them are situational ailments, some of them are physical ailments, which we repeatedly suggest we can cure with fiction as well. And we, we bring together our personal experience and um, of, of reading ourselves, giving books to each other, and the experience of, of our clients. And do you, in the book world, do you do other things as well? Do you review books or do you write I do. yourself? I do, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a novelist myself. Um, um, I publish two novels. Um, and so the reading for me has been primarily a way of finding out how to write. I mean, that is for, for most writers. So that was my driving force with my reading path, in a way. Um, um, I do review books. I review for the FT in London. Um, I've done for many years now, so um, it's a great way of keeping up with what's out there and just kind of keeping yeah. abreast of everything. Tell us a little bit about a typical session. Um, so typical book is a session. Um, okay, so there's maybe two or three different archetypal things that happen. Um, one is is somebody who is a, a huge reader already, um, has a sense of this really rich inner life that they have, that they experience in a solitary way, that they um, they spend a lot of time reading. They don't necessarily have that many people to talk about some of the more, more obscure books with. Um, they would like somebody who's read a lot to direct their path a little bit more precisely. Um, there are lots of books published these days and you can't read them all, so it's kind of important to find the right books if that is something which, which does things for you. Um, so that will be mainly, that will be a kind of discussion between two intense book lovers and trying to kind of work out their taste and try, try and help them form. Um, we do get people who come with, um, with serious things going on. We tend to get things, people, if they come because they're, they're suffering from the ailment, it tends to be quite a serious one. So we've had a lot of people who've come with being bereaved. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of people who've come because, um, they've got divorced or they've had a relationship trauma of some sort. Um, um, we've had people come with um, job issues, kind of just don't know, just, uh, you know, the crossroads kind of point. Um, I hesitate to call it a midlife crisis because it can happen at any time. But just kind of, like, this is the job I went straight into from university. I, it's not involving my soul. I need to take time out. I don't know what to do, you know, that sort of thing. So crisis moments. Um, so yeah, so that's that's oh, and the third the third one, which is which is one we were talking about a little bit earlier, which is often um, a guy who comes to us and actually doesn't read read fiction at all, <laughs> and has been sent by wife stroke partner to see if <laughs> you know I or I can convert him to reading life, <laughs> which is obviously the biggest challenge of all, yeah. but quite a fun one, mm -hmm. quite a process. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have have you ever had someone who you've just been completely stymied by? Or was um, yes, it happens. I mean, there, there have been people who've come with um, with serious depression, and you suggest something. When we we encourage feedback, um, sometimes I've had success with people who've, who've been depressed as well. I mean, you, you don't always know ultimately where they've gone, but they certainly come back and have been getting um, a more positive outlook from the books that we've been given them, um, or a sense of I'm not going mad, it's not just me, actually, that tends to be the case more often. Because um, actually we quite often, and as we do in here, prescribe um, novels which um, reflect back um, something of their experience. So mm -hmm. it's, it, seems quite, it seems quite bizarre to do that, but we do um, prescribe novels like Belgium, like The Unbearable Lightness of Being in here for cases of serious depression, because people tend to want to know that um, they're not alone. That seems like the most important thing. And, mm -hmm. 
um, actually giving them a light jolly read to cheer them up. It's not going to touch somebody who's already seriously depressed. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and occasionally you have somebody who actually does fiction and can't reach, and, and maybe it's not their thing, or maybe it just mm -hmm. isn't working for them. And that, that's, you know, there are many different types of medicine, and they hope that they find something which works for them better. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you do really believe that fiction can be curative? I do. I mean, I don't think it would be the only thing. If somebody who's very depressed, they think it's a problem for the yeah, yeah. as well. You know, we're, we're not setting ourselves up to be the female and all. Yeah. Um, I'm married to a doctor, and I know that he does really important work, but I couldn't possibly do. You know, um, but um, I do. I, I think that fiction absolutely can be transformative and life-changing, and, and I think probably everybody who's here tonight is a big reader and has experienced it at some moment. You know, maybe you know at a critical moment in their lives. Um, a book has opened a door that might not have otherwise opened for them. Do you do, you do this? Uh, you were saying upstairs that you have three or four sessions a week? Yes, we took on another bibliotherapist actually um, whilst we were writing this book because we couldn't have all the sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so she she was basically, um, once we were, were heavily involved with writing this book, we would, I don't know, I did maybe once or one or two every fortnight. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Simona would see about three or four people a week. Um, mm -hmm. And it would, it would be not just one-to-ones in person in London, but by Skype with people from all over the place. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, all right. And um, do you, it's kind of, do you feel that, do you ever feel that you want to give people the same books over and over again? Do you find that there are, I ask this from personal experience, I find that sometimes in doing bibliotherapy, you just find a book that's so rich, that works yeah. so well, and then you think, I've recommended that book now to four people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Should I really happens. be doing that? Yeah. Do you find that as well? Yes and no. I mean, it, it, it can happen. Certainly, there's a book which I think is wonderful in almost every situation, which is, I don't know if anybody knows it, but... Um, uh, it's called To the Wedding by John Berger, mm -hmm. um, which I just it's the most beautiful story of um, love triumphing over, you know, everything mm -hmm. in the end. And um, it's a great, I mean, there aren't that many novels which have that um, message so powerfully. And it sounds sentimental, but it's not. It's written in a very, um, in a very, very lyrical but totally unsentimental way, and John Berger's the most sentimental writer. Um, and that's a book that I recommend a lot. It's also slim. Um, another favourite of mine, um, which is a book which I never managed to get in here in the end, um, is uh, by Jane Mendelssohn, um, I Was Near Earhart. Oh, I know of that. Yeah, again, it's, it's, about, it's about somebody who undergoes a... It's, it's based on the life of Amelia Earhart, aviatrix, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of imagining of what might have happened had her plane crash landed on a desert island instead of disappeared off the edge of the earth and she had survived with her co with her navigator. Mm -hmm. um, and they both incredibly unhappy people who, who she doesn't enjoy the fame that's been thrust upon her really by her husband and um, and they, they become these kind of wild people mm -hmm. and rediscover their sensuality, rediscover what it is to be alive in a way that actually is really appealing <laughs> to any of us. And it's great, and it's just, it, and again, it's a short, very lyrical, very poetic novel, and it just is, it hits a really big punch. And when I, when I first read that novel, I was, I couldn't read anything for seven days afterwards. I was completely just amazed by it. It's a great premise. It's yeah, it is. It is. It's a fun premise. Yeah. Do you have novels that um, you can point to that you feel have changed your life or have made a great difference to you at a moment in your life? Um, Yes, I would say, well, funny enough, I was talking about this earlier um, with somebody who was writing about this as a, um, a study at Columbia, and I was saying I was actually cured by one of the cures of him, um, which was, um, I cured for procrastination, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I really needed this cure. So I was reading, it kind of happened in a very organic way, because I was reading The Remains of the Day by Kazuichi Guru, um, thinking we have to use this model somehow, but I don't know how yet. Um, and I started to realise that, did every people know this novel? I'm sure some of you do, yeah, most of you do. So, so it's about this kind of very stiff upper lip English butler working in a big grand house. And um, he, there is a, there is a, um, a maid, I guess you call her, called Miss Stevens, and um, 
or was he Mr. Stevens? I can never remember. Anyway, she is one of the students. Um, she kind of expresses an interest in being friendly to him and, um, and, and that there may be something more between them than just friends. Mm -hmm. And he is so scared of, of being vulnerable that he never responds to her in a human way. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, she goes off and marries somebody else, and years later he goes to visit her in his proper way and realizes that he missed a love and a life that he could have had with her. And now that he's, he's left with the remains of the day, and there's nothing left. And, and it just kind of made me realize that um, when we procrastinate, procrastination is avoiding uncomfortable emotions that we associate with the task in hand that we're procrastinating about. So, you know, if you're procrastinating about doing your accounts, it's probably because you, you're nervous that you haven't made enough money, or you fear, you know, fear of failure, you're not very good at doing it, or whatever it is. It's an uncomfortable feeling that you're trying to avoid. And of course, if you if you continue like that, you live always with these uncomfortable emotions, and mm -hmm. you have to confront your uncomfortable emotions, very brave them, and they very quickly become something else. Because once you're doing your accounts, you have a very different emotion, and once you've done them, you feel great. So it's it's it was a kind of you know a psychological circle which I became. It actually totally worked on me. I'm much better at it now. Although my accounts are idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked for you. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. Well, I thought since we're a small group, we might open it up to questions um, from all of you about the process and about um, the whole general idea of whether books can change someone's life or can help them at a particular time. Or if you have questions uh, about um, books you'd like recommended or books to deal with the problem. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, here's a question that since I started hearing about school the therapy, I was really curious about. Just, have you gotten responses from authors? of books that said about, like, oh, I saw you mention my book and you saw it as a QR for this kind of thing. Have you seen a reaction from people? No, and I'm dying to. I actually, we kind of tweeted Margaret Atwood to prompt her into, into <laughs> <laughs> giving us feedback on what all the cures involves her. Um, we, we've, um, I haven't yet. Um, although, actually, no, yes, we have one, the Rosie Project, which is in our Australia version. Um, Graham Simpson, I think that's it, which is um, a cure for um, being anally retentive. <laughs> and um, Professor Don Tillman, who's the main character in this novel, um, has a Twitter identity himself. So we've got a tweet from Professor Don Tillman saying, incredible, I am the cure for <laughs> being a control freak. So we tweeted back saying, have you cured yourself with yourself? Um, so that's the only one so far. But there was, there was um, um, we have a cure in here for hangover, which is, if you did want me to do a reading, that's one of the ones I was going to read. Um, which, um, well, why don't you do that? I think it would be I interesting. Okay. Go ahead and read The Cure for a Hangover, because I think we all need that. It's one <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, just I, I say would that, like um, to know. <laughs> that, uh, the, the, well, The Cure is um, um, The Little White Car by Danita de Rhodes, which is actually a pen name for a British writer called Dan Rhodes. But because the premise of this book is quite shameful, he decided to give himself a pen name. Do you know this book? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I can't tell you what it's about yet. In my um, and even he didn't. We asked him to guess which, which of his books um, he had, we had used as a cure and for which ailment. And we said that if he could guess it within three get goes, we'd send him a free copy of the book. And he didn't. He guessed about six times. <laughs> anyway, I think it's a good cure. Your forehead is a stage thudding with the beat of 30 drummers. Your tongue is a piece of cooked bacon that's been sitting in the fridge for a week. And your mind is a washing machine on a fast spin cycle, with shreds of the events of last night whopping against the sides, revealing their colors for a brief, ghastly moment before sinking back into the foamy suds. Yes, you have a hangover. <laughs> You get out of bed, or off the sofa, or wherever it was you passed out. You stumble towards the sink and fill a glass with cold water. You tip back your head, ouch, and begin to gulp, the lovely cool liquid bringing back to life the... Oh God, that's when you remember. Worse than the pounding head, worse than the confusion, the memory of what <laughs> exactly it was. You did. At this point, Reach for The Little White Car by Danuta de Rose. Because whatever it was you did, it wasn't as bad as what Baron did. <laughs> <laughs> a spoiled 22-year-old Parisian girl who emerged from her hangover to realize 
with a plunge into a new ice age. Well, you'll have to read it and see. <laughs> Call in sick, then go back to bed. There you will read in big fat type that won't challenge your eyes and straightforward <laughs> prose that won't befuddle your head. <laughs> a lesson in how much worse it could have been. Go on, indulge. So I don't know how to tell you what the story is. It is actually is. It is a really horrific story. It's basically this, um, and it's written in a very trifling, light way, which is why it was a very bold thing to publish this book. Um, but it is a woman who wakes up the morning after, and she's done a lot of drugs, and she's drunk a lot of alcohol, and she turns on the news, and there is the death of Princess Diana in the tunnel. And the little white car has her little white car. Oh. So it's terrific. And at the same time, he manages, it's just a real extraordinary novel in which he manages to make this a light and bruisy novel. So it's, it is quite fantastic. It reminds me, though, I did do a, a bibliotherapy session with a woman, really loved this one, but she was um, a young mother. And she was overwhelmed by being a, a young mother with two very small children, I think they were two and three and a half, or two and four, or something. She was a bit overwhelmed by this, and she was really questioning whether whether she was a good enough mother, whether she she was a bad mother or not, whether she was attentive enough. And I gave her the glass castle by Stan <laughs> Ball to read. Have you ever read this book? Yeah. It's a book about probably the worst parents who have ever lived. In psychologically speaking, they are not they don't physically abuse their children, but they are just supremely self interested yeah. and yeah. and neglectful and self-indulgent, and the poor children are just, you know, flailing around with themselves. And, and she wrote to me afterward and said, oh, that book made me feel so yeah. much better. Yeah, I mean, some, some of our kids work on that basis, and I think, um, you know, uh, yes, you're not as bad as this, is yeah. quite a common thing that we do. Because um, that's a nice positive way to make somebody, to help somebody. Yeah. Um, and sometimes a cautionary tale, just kind of, you know, don't go down this route because then that might happen, which is quite often good for matters of the heart. Yeah. Yeah. There, was a, there was one person, though, um, that I really had a lot of problems with a recommendation for, though, because she was uh, an alcoholic in recovery who was very interested in reading books about Hollywood. Mm -hmm. oh. And think of just off the top of your head, think of the great books about Hollywood. There's a drunk in every single one of them. And I was really hard put, I did finally find one, but there I was really hard put to find yeah. one about Hollywood. What did you find? Uh, Laura M Lamont's Life in Pictures by Emma Stroud. There is some now alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it's a very good book, lovely book. So, other questions? Yeah, thanks, Susan. <laughs> um, do you ever give um, your patients a bit of a rap on the knuckles, or is it always just positive, you know, well, we have making them feel better? Um, oh, yeah, I love giving raps on the knuckles, and we do it a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I mean, our, our biggest rap on the knuckle, which actually I do feel slightly guilty about now in here, is um, that we prescribe for fear of flying. Um, yeah. And actually, it's kind of difficult to talk about this in New York because obviously, people in New York have uh, end around the world, and it's not the land of a very good reason to fear um, terrorism on flights. But a fear of flying per se, which we try and separate that into that, we prescribe um, Santa Zubru's night flight, which is probably the most terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of saying, look, come on, this is what. This is what it is to be really vulnerable in the sky when you're in a little two-seater mail plane in a huge thunderstorm over the Andes, you know, and none of the controls are working anymore. And you're there and you're going, seven for seven, with a gin and tonic in your hand, come on. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, a little, yeah, definitely like that. And, and um, I'm just trying to do some other wraps on the knuckles. Um, but not morally, you know, I mean, what if a person, you know, had an affair or something like that? Oh, yeah, well, it, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, because the experience of writing this book ha did force us to take a moral stance mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of times on things, and um, I wasn't prepared for that, and I should have been, really, but, it, but it, yes, you do have to. So, so we have adultery as one of our um, one of, one of our elements, mm -hmm. so of course, you can't do it with one novel, you have to give a handful of novels, mm -hmm. because people are going to be coming at this from very different mm -hmm. you know, experiences, and 
you can't you have to be very careful not to generalize about this. Um, but you know, there's there's Anna Karenina in there. Um, yeah, I've got to look up the last one. There's you know there's uh, or, or divorce. Okay, divorce is a better example actually. So um, we've got and again. I'm going to have to look it up. But um, there's there's the kind of um, so intimacy by Hanif Qureshi, which is a novel which actually drove me mad reading it, because it's it's about a breakup on the eve of a breakup between this couple. It's written from the point of view of a man. And he clearly hasn't tried talking to his wife. <laughs> she hasn't talked to him. And you're like, guys, communicate. <laughs> so, you know, this is a sort of, you know, have you done this yet? Um, the sports writer by Richard Ford, which is a very, um, sort of lots of people here have read, a very sort of sad story of somebody who got divorced and actually kind of wishes that they hadn't. And, realize, you know, you kind of realize over the course of this novel that the things which are making him sad probably were nothing to do with his marriage. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of getting people maybe just to think outside the box a little bit. Um, and then Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Thurston, which is an amazing book, if anybody has about it, do. Um, which is kind of, okay, she, she got divorced three times, then finally she gets, she gets a good guy. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work. So you kind of try and cover all bases. But, um, but yeah, it did actually have an effect on me, just the course. I mean, literature is moral, because characters who... Um, do bad things generally get their comeuppance. I mean, generally speaking, that happens in literature. So, um, um, happy endings happen to good people. I mean, to bad people as well in literature. But, um, but okay, maybe this is a better way to think of it. The really good characters, the ones who really act well for the right reasons and don't always get the the, the, the happy ending as a result, you love. So the reader really loves the moral character, right? So in that way, literature is really deeply moral. And um, it, it, yeah, it, it, it surprised me and shocked me that I was making quite big, I don't know, pronouncements in some way about, um, to myself, in the, in, the, in, the, in the reading and writing of this. But I think you can't read a lot of fiction without that rubbing off on you. Do you think, I don't know, what's your experience with that? Do you feel? Oh, absolutely, yeah. You yeah. know, there's always sort of one character you totally empathize with. And you know, it's the, that kind of Billy Bagley thing. Yeah. yeah. But I was just wondering, you know, in your, oh. it must be difficult if somebody comes to you to say, you know, this, you know, you really shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I don't um, think I've ever done that. Have you done that, Maureen? I don't think I've ever sort of, um, I mean, one would try not to intervene. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, no, I'm not a therapist. So, um, I mean, not to be but, empathetic, you know, like yeah. say somebody's done something bad, not to even look to make them feel better. Yeah. And the hangover is a bit of a yeah. difference with finding one Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say, I, it, it's so really hard sometimes. I, ha I had someone come to me and was telling me the story of her marriage and, and you know, wanting to preserve her marriage. And the more she told me, I was sitting there thinking, believe that shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's awful. You know? and of course, then I tried to find books that I thought would be helpful <laughs> to her. But I was a little bit appalled. The hardest thing i found is to try and find books about happy marriage. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very, very very yeah. yeah. A happy marriage doesn't make for a good story. No, no. apparently it yeah. doesn't. Yeah, characters that communicate well, who wants it? I mean, you kind of learn that early on as a fiction writer. You've got to, you've got to have characters who miscommunicate, misfire the whole time, and then you've got a story happening, you've got tension happening. Yeah. So yeah, it's very hard. And actually, towards the beginning of this process, I was kind of thinking, okay, I want to write a really good cure. I want to write a novel that's a really good cure. And I had a go at doing my happy marriage type book, and it just didn't work. <laughs>